Welcome everyone. James McKim is the founder and managing partner of Organizational Ignition, a management consulting practice. He is a sought after organizational, organizational performance speaker, coach, change manager, and author of the best-selling book, The Diversity Factor, Igniting Superior Organizational Performance. In his more than 35 year career, he has helped small and large organizations, for-profit and nonprofit, spark efficiency and growth through the aligning of people, process, and technology. As the chair of the Episcopal Church's National Executive Council Committee, Anti-Racism and Reconciliation, Mr. McKim was the principal writer of the church's guidelines on anti-racism and reconciliation. As president of the Manchester branch of the NAACP, he works regularly with governments and businesses to eliminate discrimination. He is a frequent conference presenter, a guest on radio and national and television shows, serves as the chair of the finance committee of the New Hampshire PBS board of directors, and delights in being the vocalist for the jazz band, the Episco Cats. Welcome, James McKim. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you to everyone for taking the time this evening to, uh, to be here and uh, enter into a conversation about how to have difficult conversations. Um, so I like to start off my conversations uh, at this, this particular uh, type of conversation by hearing from you, uh, what are the types of situations or topics that you would like to be able to deal with better? What are the difficult kinds of conversations or topics that you would like to be able to deal with better? And you can feel free to uh, come off mute and share those or type them into the chat. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to capture that uh, wrong screen. I'm going to capture those on my screen. Uh, and we're going to come back to those. Um, we're going to come back to them at the end of our session and see uh, if there's, uh, see what you think about. Um, how to address those kinds of topics or conversations uh, after the session. So what, what topics or type of situation would you like to be able to address? I will speak up again because I, um, I can read chat, but I cannot write in it. My name is David Richmond. I am in Durham. And what interests me most is what happens when I am conversing with people whom I know are lying. Uh, and we have heard many, many lies, particularly the big lie, over the last several years. How do we deal with that? OK. All right. Um, someone else. Um, I find myself in situations uh, where I'm, I'm faced with anti-Semitism, uh, racism, and homophobia. Not all at once. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Someone else. In the chat, we have... Uh, when someone is believing a lie and reason doesn't work in the conversation, right? And on the iPhone, LGBTQ plus rights. All right, anyone else? Last chance. One more from Ingrid, conversation with someone who is not forthright or is dodging. Okay, that's somewhat similar to the lying, but uh, a little bit different. Okay, we will um, we'll capture those and come back to them uh, toward the end of the session. Can I ask, can I say one more thing? Yes. Um, how can I ask for a raise 
you know, in my job, how can I ask for a raise? Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, so let me do this and get started. That's our, oops, reverse here, swap. That's our last slide. Right, let me go to, so in addition to what you all mentioned as difficult topics, um, here are a few that have surfaced over the many times that I have delivered this workshop. This is my most asked for workshop. Um, so one that I think someone mentioned, how do I call out? And actually we, we talk about calling in people rather than calling out people who make racist, sexist or derogatory remarks. How do we set boundaries it is usually a difficult conversation for many people. Um, how do we talk about harm reduction? Conversations around harmful behavior. Um, conversations with colleagues about why harm reduction is important. We've had many of these conversations and needs through these conversations as we uh, went through the pandemic and conversations about whether or not people should be wearing masks or whether they should be forced to wear masks. Uh, suicide prevention is, is definitely a topic that comes up. I'm not gonna get into that here because it takes people who are really trained at doing having those kinds of conversations. Um, but I, I mention it because this is what people bring up when I ask this question. Um, the, the personal choice regarding the vaccine to get it or not is that explicit example about harm reduction. And then advocating for your needs or others. Flo just added, how do I ask for a raise? So that's, how do I advocate for myself? So with that, here's how I see this time together going. I'm gonna start off with some conversational norms. And this is important because uh, as Dr. Dadi Morris from King State says, we need to set the table for productive conversations about difficult topics. And you've all raised difficult topics. So we're gonna set the table for talking about these difficult topics. Then we're gonna talk about conversational basics. You know, we, we have conversations all the time, but no one has ever or rarely do we ever have explained to us, what is a conversation? What are the basics? How are we supposed to act in a conversation? And I've had communications majors go through this conversation with me and they've not actually been taught how to have a good conversation. So we're gonna talk about that. And then we're gonna talk about skills and barriers. What skills you currently have, and this is when we'll do a breakout. We'll actually break you up into, into groups and have you talk about what skills you currently have because you have some, whether you recognize it or not. And what barriers are there to having a productive conversation about a difficult topic? Then we're gonna talk about some guidelines you might follow along with some possible responses that you might have in your back pocket. Frequently, one of the barriers that folks cite for not having a productive conversation or even entering into a difficult conversation is they don't know what to say. Okay. So we're gonna give you some stock phrases that you can just have in, the, have in your back pocket, have in your mind when you get into these situations. And then we're going to come back to your difficult conversation situations or topics and see how you might address them. And then we'll wrap up. So that's where we're headed over the next uh, the next few minutes. Does that look okay? All right. So next, conversational norms. These are all set up, as I said, to set the table for having a productive conversation about a difficult topic. And they're also set up to create what Dr. Eric Law from the Kaleidoscope Institute calls a gracious space. 
So you've probably heard of this notion of a safe space. How many of you have heard of the safe space before? Yes. So most folks have heard of the notion of a safe space where you can just be yourself. You don't have to do anything. You can just be there and feel comfortable. So a safe space is good to have, but it's not good when you're trying to have a productive conversation. Um, and some people evolve a safe space into a brave space. And the brave space is where you can be brave enough to enter into a conversation. Well, for me and for many, that notion of having to be brave to get into a conversation, that can be very frightening. So Eric's notion of a gracious space is one where we feel comfortable being there and it's okay to, to speak and be ragged. And everyone knows that we'll not be judged by the raggedness of what we're saying. Everyone holds each other up in love in this conversation. So these norms are designed to create that gracious space that lets us have a productive conversation. So first of all, stay engaged. When uh, we've been taught, it's been drilled into us not to talk about race, not to talk about sex, not to talk about politics, not to talk about religion in um, public company. But if we don't talk about them, how can we address those issues? So we, we've been taught to, to not talk about them. So we tend to shy away when we hear the topic being discussed or broached, but we need to stay engaged. So that's the first norm. The second norm is sharing airtime. We get so caught up with trying to make our arguments about something that we don't allow the other person or other people in the room to say something. So the second norm is sharing airtime. Once you said something, let the other person, or if you're in a group, let two or three other people speak before you speak again. Okay. Um, there's a saying that I think relates to this. God gave us two ears, two eyes, and one mouth. We need to talk less, observe, and listen more. Next, be patient with yourself and with others. Be patient with yourself and with others. We all have different experiences. We're all at different points in a journey of dealing with these issues. So if something is said, others in the room might grasp that concept very quickly. And you might have trouble with it because you just don't have the background or experience to grasp it. That's perfectly okay. Be patient with yourself. Also, others may not have the knowledge and experience to grasp what's being discussed. Be patient with them because they just have different experiences. Right? Next, speak your truth as you are able. Speak your truth as you're able. Do not try to speak someone else's truth. Speak your truth. So how do we do that? How do we speak our own truths? What kind of language do we use? Anybody? When we're speaking our own truths, Probably how do we do I, that? I, I statement. Bing, 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 I bing, bing. We use I statements, first person. I heard this. I felt this. I observed this. That's speaking our own truths, which no one should be able to or shouldn't contradict. Now, we know that there are people who do that who do contradict what others say, that they actually are feeling. And there's a, there's a term for that. Anybody know what the term for 
making someone for for questioning what someone says they feel. The term is gaslighting. Gaslighting is interacting with someone, commenting about their feelings that they've expressed. So we need to speak our own truths as we're able. Next, notice your judgments. We're not asking you to not judge. We're asking you to notice your judgments because stopping and noticing our judgments is where we start to realize where biases may be creeping in to our own thinking. Anyone know how many decisions each of us makes in a day? Anyone? 35,000. We make 35,000 decisions every day. And on top of that, how do we make them? 90 to 95% of those decisions are made by our unconscious mind. And this is where bias lives. So if we start noticing the decisions we're making, noticing our judgments, we'll start to notice where bias is creeping in. Next, we are all teachers and we are all learners. We all have different experiences. So we all have something to teach and we all have something to learn. And this is a norm that comes from the work of Carol Dweck at Stanford <laughs> University and her work in um, the notion of having a growth mindset. Anybody heard of that, that term before, the growth mindset? So that growth mindset is where we know that we don't know everything and we want to learn more. We want to learn from our mistakes. We want to learn from the, the experiences of others. We read biographies because we want to learn. We reflect on our past and how we've behaved because we want to learn how to get better. So we're all teachers and we're all learners. Next, respect confidentiality. So if you're in a conversation that is going to be heated but needs to be productive, if you can set the ground rules that says, what I say here or what is said here is not going to leave this space. That allows everyone to, to be vulnerable, to be okay with being raw and ragged especially if we're noticing our judgments, speaking our own truth as we're able and holding each other up in love. Okay. Next, expect and accept non-closure. Expect and accept non-closure. Our society has taught us to, that we need to solve all of our problems immediately. Well, not all problems are solvable immediately. It has taken our culture hundreds of years to develop to the way it is. The attitudes that people have, the way that our culture works has taken centuries. It is not gonna be changed overnight, next week, next month, next year, maybe not even in our lifetimes. We need to expect and accept non-closure. Doesn't mean we don't try to change things or to influence how people think, but we should not get frustrated if we are not successful. And if we are successful, well, that's icing on the cake. And last but not least, oops and ouch. Anybody heard of oops and ouch before? I hear, see some some. Uh, heads nodding. So what is, one of you who, who knows what oops and ouch is, what, what is it? Explain oops and ouch for me. Okay. 
Anyone? I'm going to guess that it might be saying hurtful things. Not quite. So oops and ouch is the notion that if you say something, and as soon as it leaves your lips, you think that didn't quite come out the way that I wanted it to come out. Or you see a reaction on the person you're speaking with that makes you think they didn't quite get what I said. You can say, oops, just as if you dropped the glass on the floor, you say, oops. So that lets everyone in the situation know that you know that what you just said didn't quite come out the way that you wanted it to. And this is um, separating intent from impact. When we say something, we have an intent. But because we are all different, because we have unique experiences, the impact may be totally different than our intent. And we need to be responsible, not just for our intent, but also for our impact. So we can say oops if we recognize that something we said did not quite come out the way we wanted it to come out or did not have the impact we wanted it to have. The flip side of the oops is ouch. If you hear something or see something that doesn't land on you right, that offends you, you can say ouch. That lets everyone in the room know that something that was just put out there, hurt you. And there's an opportunity again to dive into what just happened and what's the perhaps difference between the intent and the impact. So oops and ouch are actually ways of living into one of the other norms we've just talked about. Anyone care to take a stab at what other norm we just talked about? There are actually a couple, but one in particular I'm thinking about. Speak your truth. Yeah, speak your Speaking truth. your yeah. truth as you're able. It is a form of I statement. Oops, I said something I recognized didn't come out right. Or oops, I felt offended by what was just said, or what was just said didn't land right on me. So these are the norms and uh, they're extremely helpful to uh, um, use in a conversation to set it up for success. It may seem awkward to do so, but in the end, um, you'll have a much more productive conversation if you talk about how we're gonna have this difficult conversation first. All right? Questions about these? Yeah, can you give an example of gaslighting? Uh, an example of gaslighting. So um, an example of gaslighting is if a um, if a per if a person describes something uh, with a lot of emotion. Uh, maybe complains that they're that the situation doesn't seem right to them with a lot of emotion, and someone else says, "Oh, don't be don't be so uh, dramatic about it. It's not that upsetting. It's not that big of an issue." That talking about the tone of the the person who made the statement that's gaslighting. It's not that dramatic. Well, if I feel it's dramatic, <laughs> it's dramatic to me. Might not be dramatic to you, but it's dramatic to me and don't deny my feelings. Gaslighting is a form of control. Other, other questions about, uh, and I see David, I see your hand up. Right, um, with the exception of this very, very good example you just gave uh, about gaslighting, um, it seems to me that everything else uh, in this uh, very lucid 
exposition you've given is assuming, or at least I'm inferring, so maybe you can tell me if I'm drawing the wrong inference, that everyone in the conversation is speaking in good faith. Oh. And many people in conversations uh, don't speak in good faith. And yep. what do we do when that happens? We are going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Um, I, I, I guess what I will say right now is um, when we're setting the table, we're setting it, we're explicitly saying, we're assuming that there were, uh, we're agreeing to have this conversation in good faith. That's setting it up. And, and that in and of itself is somewhat of a warning to those who might not normally speak in, uh, speak uh, uh, with good intent. That's a warning that you expect them to speak in good intent. Right? Doesn't guarantee it, but if you don't make that statement up front, then chances are greater that someone who already has in mind not speaking the truth will not speak the truth. So we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more and a little bit later too. Uh, Judy, I see you got your hand up. Yeah, maybe I'm missing something, but um, I understand all of what you said, but what happens if you're in a social situation just over dinner with friends mm -hmm. and then the topic comes up and someone has said something offensive to you, is it the time and place to say something without making them feel defensive, um, backing them into a corner? I never that's know what, what to do. So that, I don't that's what this session, that's what this conversation is gonna is all about. How do you deal with those situations? Okay. This is just setting the table to start the conversation. It's not for when you're in the, well, it's for in your, when you're in the conversation too, but it's setting the table, setting the ground rules for how we're supposed to behave so that the conversation can be productive. And if you can get people to agree to these up front, that can go a long way in uh, preventing them from, um, from engaging in um, the conversation uh, in a non-productive way. Can't guarantee it, but it goes a long way. All right, so let's talk about communication basics. This is the Shannon and Weaver model of communication. And it says that there is a sender of a message in a communication and a receiver of a message in a communication. So the question germane here is, who is responsible for ensuring that a message gets across? Is it the sender or the receiver? Who is responsible? We're making sure that a message gets across. Is it the sender or the receiver? The sender. We have a sender. Mm -hmm. I think Anyone it's else? a receiver. All right, we have a receiver. It's both. both. <laughs> it's a both from Cheryl. Yeah. So the answer is the sender. Why do we say the sender has the responsibility? Because the person the, the sender needs to uh, come up with the right words uh, to explain what the person wants to, I guess, to explain to the other person so the other person can understand. That, that, that's, that's, that's pretty close. <laughs> Only the sender knows what the message is. Only the sender knows what the intent is. So if you said receiver or both, what you're probably thinking about is the receiver needs to at least provide some feedback to the sender. Right? So the sender has a sense of whether the impact was what was intended but it's still the sender's responsibility because only the sender knows for sure if what the receiver said is what they intended. So as you go into these conversations, think about if you are the sender, 
of the message. If you're making an argument, you need to be responsible for making sure that the receiver got the message you intended. Don't leave it up to the receiver. Don't just let the receiver give you feedback and you not process that feedback. Right? You have to make sure the message gets across. And if you're the receiver, you need to make sure that you provided that feedback. And you can even prompt the sender to ask, did my feedback, did the way I responded to you make sense? Is it in comport with the, what you intended? You can prompt the sender because sometimes the sender doesn't know that it's their responsibility to make sure their message got across. So that's the, the basic communication. And I, one of the reasons why we need to make sure that our intent is actually gotten across is because everyone's different. We all have different experiences. So a word that I might utter, which has meaning for me because of my background and experiences, may have a different meaning for you because you have different background and experiences than I do. So next we come to the question, when it comes to understanding meaning in a conversation, what percentage of meaning comes from the words themselves? What percentage of meaning in a conversation comes from the words being spoken? 20%. We have a 20% from Cheryl. 40%. 40% from Deborah. Anyone else? 45. 45. Gonna, 45, 45, gonna, 45, 45, 45, 45. Do I hear I 50? 100. <laughs> I'm going to say 100 also. Up the ante. Up the ante. 50%. 50%. 50-50. So, as it turns out, 7% of the meaning comes from the words themselves. 38% comes from the paralinguistics or how words are spoken. And if you think about it, the same word spoken differently has different meaning. Think of Chinese where the same word spoken differently has drastically different meaning. And even in English, the word yes, depending upon how we say the word yes, we can say yes, 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 depending upon how that word is spoken, it has a different meaning. And then 55% of meaning is derived from facial expressions. And I, I, I would add body language to that as well. And so just think about what we've just been going through with a pandemic, where, what were we wearing? Masks on our faces? And we wonder why it's difficult to understand people. Because 55% of meaning in a conversation comes from facial expressions and body language. So if someone is saying yes, but they're shaking their head like this, we get confused, don't we? Because the word doesn't match their body language or facial expression. So when we're in these conversations, we need to recognize that the words being used may be different in meaning for the person speaking them from us. The way that, they, that someone speaks those words may have an influence on the meaning as well, a greater influence than just the words themselves. And then the facial expressions used, which are pretty generic across the globe, by the way. What is cheese salt? So this, the, this is the communication basics, the sender-receiver model and 
uh, how meaning gets derived. So let's move on to thinking styles. So let's say we, we comprehend the meaning. Ned Herman came up with what he calls the whole brain thinking model. And he says that we can exhibit four different thinking styles. We have the capability to exhibit four different thinking styles, to think in four different ways. The first way he says is logical, where we focus on facts and figures. Joe Friday's just the facts man, right? And the bottom line. The second thinking style he says is creative, where we look for the for, we look at the big picture of a situation and we try to see the, human, the humanity and sometimes the humor in the situation. The third thinking style, he says, is relational, where we focus on the feelings that are welling up in us and the feelings that we're sensing from the other person or people in the conversation. And then we can also exhibit a practical thinking style where we focus on organizing the information that we're, we're seeing and gathering and making sure that we're following through and getting done what needs to get done. So while we can exhibit each of these thinking styles, Herman says that we have a preferred thinking style. We have a go-to thinking style. When we're stressed, we go to this preferred thinking style. So, I'm gonna ask you now to stop and think for a minute. Which of these four thinking styles is your preferred thinking style? Which are you most comfortable with? David, I see your hand up. Well, I'm afraid that I, I will not choose one or the other of those. Of course, I use them all. I think we all use them all in uh, combination. So I don't have a particular preferred thinking style. So I, I, I as I, I think I said, I'll point out that Herman says, we can exhibit all of these thinking styles, but what are we most comfortable with? Right. So who's most comfortable with logical? I right. see a few hands up. Who's most comfortable with creative? Couple, all right. Who's most comfortable with relational? One. And who's most comfortable, like me, with practical? Right. So we have a, a um, distribution of preferred thinking styles in the room. So what happens if I'm a logical, or let's say, where, where are my logical thinking style preferred people? All right, so if you're making an argument with someone, if you're trying to get a point across to someone, you're likely as a logical person to be spouting off facts and figures, right? What if the person with whom you are speaking has a relational preferred thinking style? You're in this, this tense discussion where we gravitate to our preferred thinking style. So if this other person is relational, what's going to, going to happen? If I, I knew that Kristen. ahead of time, if I knew that, I guess I would check in with them. How are you feeling? <laughs> I, you know, if I had thought of that, of this information, I might see them getting, I don't, might see something in their body that's telling me it's going well or not going well, I suppose. And if the facts don't match their feelings, which I find happens, mm -hmm. you know, they don't feel that way and your facts are saying something that is the opposite of their feelings, that's, that's when it gets into sort of a very uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. So <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but just even without thinking about the meaning so, so much, if you're spouting off facts and figures and you're, you're and there's a heated conversation, to a relational person, those facts and figures are going to go in one ear and out the other. Right. They're right. not focusing on the, the data, the facts. 
They're focusing on feelings. And how it makes them feel, exactly, yeah. Right, right. So what this says is we need to get to know the people with whom we're speaking before, if we can, before we get into this topic of difficult discussion. Back to setting the table. <laughs> Create that relationship first so that you understand how to connect with that person. All right. So David, I see you have your hand up and then Kristen, you have your hand up too. No, I just, I didn't uh, lower my hand from the last one. Let me see if I can do that. Okay, all right. So these thinking styles are important to, to know and to think about when you're having a conversation that is about a difficult topic. So now we're gonna get into what Deborah was talking about a little bit more and I did not pay her to use that example. Um, so I'll give you a second to take a look at this Dilbert cartoon. So what's this one all about? Well, it's all about facts versus values and beliefs. This notion of cognitive dissonance. When the facts don't match my values or beliefs. And when that happens, what do I call those facts? How do I think about those facts? You they're, think wrong. They're... they're wrong. <laughs> they're wrong. Wrong. The, the data wasn't collected properly. Can't be because it doesn't match my values or beliefs. You didn't report them right. This is because we have a bias that is called a confirmation bias. We seek to find information that validates our values and beliefs. And why is this? Because every second, our five senses send millions of bits of data to our brains. And we have to make sense of those millions of bits of data in a split second, a millisecond. And the only way we can do that is by a process called generalization. Our brains find patterns in those millions of bits of data, those patterns that match our past experience, what we've seen, what we've heard, what we've been taught. Our brains are constantly looking for patterns that confirm our values and beliefs. So when someone is lying to you, it's because what's being presented to them does not comport with their values or beliefs. Their values or beliefs may be an agenda that they're trying to push, but still their value or belief. And the data that you have that you're presenting is a lie. Sometimes the data that they're presenting is a lie because they're trying to justify their values and beliefs. Where does evidence come in on this? Where does evidence come in on this? Yeah, because if you have certain values and beliefs that you have no evidence that supports them, it's, it seems like it's fantasy. That is a precursor to another um, discussion we're gonna have in a few minutes. Where the evidence comes in. So it helps to know here, again, building relationship first, what are the values and beliefs of the person with whom we're speaking? So that when you do try to make a point, you have a better sense of how to connect with them. 
speaking about their values and their beliefs, which they are interested in upholding. If you don't speak about their values and beliefs, then th they're probably gonna dismiss you. They're not gonna agree with you. They're gonna think, well, you don't know anything. You don't, you don't understand me. Which leads us to the work of Jonathan Haidt uh, and his book, The Righteous Mind. And I don't know if the library has that, a number of the libraries have it, but it's a fantastic book. It blew my mind. Because he talks about what is ethics? What is morality? What are the components of ethics and morality? What are the values that we have as individuals? He talks about how Eastern culture values community above all. Whereas we in Western culture value the individual overall. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. But it explains a lot about how people from the East behave, what they value, how they think. Herman said, uh, Herman, sorry, um, Haidt, Jonathan Haidt says that he, he came up with what he calls moral foundation theory. And he says that morals and ethics are based on six factors or what he calls tastes, six tastes, which I'm showing you here in, uh, in, the, in the chart. There is a care harm taste, there's a fairness cheating taste, there's a loyalty betrayal taste, there's an authority subversion taste, there's a sanctity degradation taste, and there is a liberty oppression taste. So we base our, our morals and ethics around these six tastes. Anyone care to guess which of these tastes conservatives favor? And small c conservative now, not the political parties, but people who are conservative thinking. Which of these tastes do small c conservatives favor. Flora? Fairness. Fairness and cheating. Fairness and cheating. So that's one taste. What do they value more? Care and harm. Care and harm. Liberty and oppression. Liberty and oppression. Sanctity and degradation. Sanctity and degradation, okay. You care I'm about afraid, those the, more. I'm afraid the conservatives that I have uh, met will say that they value liberty, but at least in my experience, uh, what I detect they're actually getting at is liberty for them and oppression for people they dislike. Could be. So Jonathan Haidt says the research that's been done shows that conservatives actually value, conservative thinking people value all six tastes pretty equally. But liberal thinking people value the care harm taste and the liberty oppression taste more than the others. In fact, almost to the exclusion of the others. So if you listen to conservative thinkers, if you read something by a conservative journalist or columnist, you'll see the words they use actually touch on most of, if not all of these tastes. They'll talk about loyalty, they'll talk about nationality. They'll talk about listening to authority versus 
those who are liberal thinkers, when they write, they'll focus on care, harm, and liberty or oppression, but they won't really say much about, and sometimes they may talk about fairness, but they won't really touch it, talk about authority. They won't really talk about sanctity. So as we said with the last couple of slides, and, and we, could, we could spend an hour on any of these slides, right? Um, but it helps to know who you're talking to or with, to know what they value. So you can know what words to use, to know whether you need to talk about authority or whether you don't need to talk about authority in your argument. And what this makes me think of is advice that Aristotle gave centuries ago about what constitutes a good argument. What are the three main components of a good argument? And anyone know what Aristotle said? I don't know if this is the um, passage of Aristotle that you have in mind. Uh, what I'm thinking of is uh, rational appeal, emotional appeal, and ethical appeal. Bing, 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 bing. Ethos, pathos, and logos. Good arguments address all three components. Good speeches address all three components. So with all of this put together, how do we think about these difficult conversations? Well, Doug Stone, Bruce Patton, and Sheila Heen in their book, Difficult Conversations, suggest that every difficult conversation is actually three conversations in one. The first conversation is about what happened, who's right, what was the intent, Who's to blame? Just the facts, ma'am, if you will. They say the second component, the second conversation that's going on is one about feelings, which are uncontrollable. We have them. Whether we like to admit it or not, we have them. Jonathan Haidt in his book talks about whether we're ruled by facts or whether we as humans are ruled by emotions. And he says that David Hume was actually right. He said that we're ruled by our emotions and our logic only serves to get us what we want. So we have feelings and feelings are part of these difficult conversations. And they're, they're part of these difficult conversations because we care about them. We care about this topic. They say the third conversation going on is about our identity. We're all taught not to offend others. So if I say something to you that offends you, if you say, ouch, <laughs> one of the things that going, that's going through my mind is, oops, I offended someone, I hurt someone. I'm not supposed to do that. Am I bad because of that? Am I a bad person? Am I a competent person? Am I worthy of love? Whether we recognize that that's what's going through our heads. So with these three conversations going on, the trio says that the way forward is to shift to a learning stance. Shift to a learning stance in these conversations. First of all, have your feelings or they will have you is the phrase that they use. We all have hot buttons. And some people might use the term triggers, but I've learned lately not to use that term because in uh, the substance abuse world, the word trigger is a trigger. In the suicide world, the word trigger is a trigger. So hot buttons is the phrase that I 
time to start to use. Uh, we want to um, not think about who's right, but think about understanding the other person. Eliminate or abandon the blame game. And don't assume that someone meant what they said. This is the disentangling of intent from impact. Assume they had good intentions. One of the reasons why, we, why that's the case of assuming it's good intentions is that if someone knows, if someone thinks that you don't believe they, that they have good intentions, their defenses are going to go up and you're not going to have a productive conversation. Well, I should say no chance of a good conversa productive conversation. You still might not have one, but your chances will be less. Okay. So along with this switching to the learning stance is the whole notion of uh, St. Francis's prayer. Seek to understand before seeking to be understood. So questions about this before we shift gears a little bit. I, I have a question. Is this for like every conversation or just the ones that are difficult? The ones that are difficult. Well, I, I say the ones are difficult, but some of these, this advice works for any conversation you might have. I have a question, um, and it might be, it might be obvious, but uh, it takes two people to have this conversation, right? You can't have one person saying, I really want to understand what you're saying, and have the other person pushing an agenda item. You both have to be willing to participate in this. Is that yeah. Okay. Yes, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. We are going to talk more about that in just a minute. The understanding seems to be more the focus than who's right or wrong. That we understand one another and listen um, can right. frequently be, you know, the end of the conversation or you know, conclusion of the conversation. Right. In our society, we're taught we need to resolve things quickly, come, come to a solution quickly, which tends to make us not listen to the other person because we have our own perspective. We think we're right. We try to get that across and we go like this. This is a very timely uh, discussion giving the climate in this country. And I wish um, more people were taking this and more politicians were listening to you. <laughs> we're working on that. Um, not sure how far we'll get. The, the, the Democratic Caucus, actually I've, I've um, facilitated some workshops with the Democratic Caucus in the New Hampshire uh, House. The Republican caucus have not been able to make inroads into yet. I'm not stopping, trying, but that's where we are. Well, good luck. Thank you. All right, let, let's, uh, let's move on. So next, I want to break you out into groups and have you talk about these two questions. What skills do you have currently to have productive conversations about difficult topics? And what are the barriers to having a productive, good conversation about a difficult topic? So I'm gonna put those questions in the chat and then break you out into groups. I have to go. Okay, uh, where's my chat? Chat is here. All right, so those should be in the chat for when you are in the breakout rooms and there's my breakout control. 
There's my breakout control. There are 11 of us. So why don't we do, why don't we have uh, three rooms? And I'll give you eight minutes for this. And all right, so everyone is in a room. That's good. Ah, that good conversation? I think so. Yes. So I'd love to hear a little bit about what you talked about. And that first question, what skills do you have? That was for you to for your for your own kind of thinking. But I am interested in hearing some of your thoughts around that second question. What are some barriers? <clears throat> Feel free to type in the chat or come off mute and speak, whichever works for you. Um, we talked about emotions sometimes being really strong and interfering in your ability to think clearly or articulate like a little too much passion um, can happen um, as well as sometimes when it's someone really close to you like a relative or a friend the fear of harming your relationships through mm -hmm. conversations right Feelings, didn't we talk, just talk about feelings? One of the three conversations going on. Another group. Barriers. I think we, uh, we talked about use statements. You know, when a, when a conversation breaks down and gets argumentative and, um, and you start throwing around the you said, you feel, you, statements rather than the I statements that can be a inhibitor to further conversation. Good, good. You statements. Uh, Deborah, you were gonna say something? Um, well, you, you have those four sort of ways of thinking. And if you just, uh, it's it, that was sort of a light bulb for me when I saw those because I clearly am very logical and fact-based. And if people have feelings, you need to back away from that way of thinking and try to be more sympathetic to how they're feeling or what they're and think about, you know, oh, they're coming from a different direction and respect that. Mm -hmm. So that was an eye opener for me is that I will tend to say, you know, get stuck on this little point <laughs> that's really irrelevant to the big picture. And we you know, to look at more than my little fact or evident evidence related thing. Um, just be more open and not shut down, not get stuck. Good. So, some barriers, you've touched on a number of these, but what's going on in the community can be a barrier, right? Or what's going on in the group or the association that this person is in, or that you're in together? Or what may be going on at the local level? What, what may be going on in discussions and planning meetings, planning board meetings, select board meetings? Uh, what may be going on at the state? We have last year, the Divisive Concepts Act, the Right to Freedom from Discrimination Act, is the formal name, was passed, which has sent a chill into many teachers. They don't want to touch the topics of race sex, age, right? What's going on in the nation can be a barrier. Uh, we uh, just talked about, we just talked about the perspective that someone's coming from. And something David um, alluded to, what's the motivation of the individual to be part of a productive conversation in the first place? 
If someone's not motivated to have a productive conversation, you're not going to have a productive conversation. Right. So you have to find out, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the experience. People may not have the experience that you have. So that might be a barrier. The power dynamic. This comes in when you're, uh, for, for Flora, asking for a raise. There is a power dynamic there. Gender, race, age differences, those are all potential barriers. And there can be an elephant in the room, some unspoken issue that's influencing this conversation. We've also heard people say, well, I don't feel smart enough to have this conversation. I don't have enough facts to have this conversation. Right? Or I don't wanna create tension. I don't want to rock the boat a feeling of not wanting to rock the boat. These are all barriers to a productive conversation. So what are some guidelines we can follow in having these difficult conversations? Well, we've talked about some of these already. Paraphrasing. If we're the recipient of a message, we need to sort of paraphrase what we've heard. Active listening, not passive listening. We need to remember that there are these three conversations in every difficult conversation. And be sure we're prepared to deal with the emotional hotspots that might set us off. We have talked about St. Francis's prayer first, seek to understand, not to be understood or confrontational. And then seek points of agreement or overlap first, right? Once you've understood the other person, articulate where there's agreement. And don't be tempted to take it off course by any anger that might crop up. Right? So these are some guidelines. So what are some responses you can give when you hear a racist, sexist, or offensive comment? What are some things you might say? Ouch. Ouch. Ouch, good, good. I guess if it's a, if it's an off color joke, I I would just hit it. I'm afraid I hit the nail on the head. Just I don't really find that funny. Okay. I, I think don't think that's funny. Called on, called on inappropriate stuff. Make that statement. Good. How about that makes me feel uncomfortable? How about that makes me feel uncomfortable? Good. Good. Or as I used to teach my four-year-olds, stop it, I don't like it when. Stop it, I don't like it when. And then elaborate whatever the when is. Right. I don't know if you can hear me, but. Yes. I was gonna say uh, that's a painful comment. That's a painful comment, okay. Kind of like the ouch. So here are some phrases that you can have in your back pocket, similar to what some of you have already said. I didn't quite hear you. Would you mind repeating that? We know that we say things sometimes without thinking about them, about what we're saying. So just having to stop and think about, and remember what it was I said might make me go, oops, Could you clarify what you mean by that? Help me understand what you mean by that. 
Is the person's race, sex, age, or ability relevant to the story? The situation? Just ask that question. Again, asking for clarification. The learning stance. Do you actually believe that? If so, help me understand why. Getting to that notion of beliefs. If you're in a group, you can say, I didn't want to single you out before, but that comment made me uncomfortable and here's why. So a couple of you nailed that one. Or I don't really feel comfortable when you make comments like that. Hmm, do you have evidence to support that? So these are some phrases. Um, would you say that if, if the person in question was white, male, straight, able-bodied, or young? Right. Asking for clarification. Stock in your mind. And some of these you might use on people with different thinking styles. The word feel is better for what thinking style? Creative. Creative? Mm -hmm. No, not creative. Relation. Kristen mouthed it without with being on mute. Relational. Feelings are about relational. Versus the if so, why, or the do you have evidence to support that belief is more for the logical folks. Right. So putting it all together, it's valuable to know your purpose for having a difficult conversation with someone. Identify what your desired outcome is beforehand, if you can. Know when to raise it and when to let it go. If you can, plan out the conversation. Avoid those impetuous conversations because you're likely to have the emotions build up in you and overtake you. If you have to have the conversation, make sure you're shifting to a learning stance seeking to understand and not be confrontational. And then beginning from that third story, finding points of agreement or overlap first. And only once you know that the other person understands your point of view and you understand their point of view, do you shift into problem solving. And you can take the lead in paraphrasing and thinking about moral foundation theory as you think about how to resolve the issue. Okay. So questions about what we've talked about here. Judy, if you're talking, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, some conversations need to be kept private and mm -hmm. would be better off in private. Um, and that would make the other person feel more comfortable, I think, listening to yes. you. Yes. Um, and sometimes I think that things just, you just, it's not the time, it's neither the time nor the place to you know, to attempt a conversation. That's right, that's right. You have to be judicious as to when you bring, when you call someone in. Right. And, and I sometimes do for, for managers, you have to call in the behavior immediately. Even if, it, and especially if it's done in front of others. As a manager, you need to set the tone.
Sorry, Judy, I think I might have cut you off, but I wanted to make sure. No, you I was just I was just going to say that um, I think in this in the present climate that we're in, even though all of this makes sense, it makes it a little harder. And that might be me. I might be pro I'm probably part of the problem. <laughs> Well, it's, it's more difficult because what I've found is the older I get, the more difficult this is. Yeah. Because I, the older I get, and I've, I've learned from my parents and my elders that the older you get, the more you don't feel like messing around with this stuff. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> I remember why, when I turned 60, think? I said, I don't suffer fools lightly. That is the phrase, yes. Do not suffer fools lightly. Why do you say you don't want to enter into a difficult conversation as you age? I think as, as I age, I feel more um, confident in myself. And um, It's not that you don't want to enter into the conversation. It's that you don't have the patience. You don't want to have the patience it takes to listen to the other person all the way through and truly understand them. You don't suffer fools lightly. Exactly. You get into the conversation and someone's just, just being very, um, it, it does not have a growth mindset and is not seeking to understand. We get frustrated with them. Right, but sometimes you have the wisdom to make a statement that makes them pause. Well, and that's why- and That's what hopefully as an old elder- Yes, <laughs> yes. You can hold yes. that wand up a little bit. Right. Not saying that we, we don't have the wisdom and the ability, it's just that the older we get, the less we want to. All right, let me uh, get to your difficult conversations. I know we're at 8.01, at least 8.01 by my clock and want to be somewhat sensitive to, want to be sensitive to your timing too, because it's, it's evening. Um, so if you, if you need to leave, totally understand. I appreciate your being here, um, but if you want to stick around for a few more minutes and go through these, uh, I'm happy to, to do that and go through those right now. So, Mary Ellen, political discussions. Any tips, any, any thoughts as to how to approach political discussions based on what we have talked about? Well, I don't know. I, I think a lot of these political discussions kind of start, at least in my family, with a provocation, like somebody provoked somebody to start the dialogue. But it's a lot of time, and I was saying to the women, I was in the breakout room, it'll start with a text, you know, and then as the text goes along, people who disagree, you know, it just goes off the rails, I think. And that's maybe because you don't, you don't have all those other things that we generally read when we're having a conversation. There's no facial expression. There's no body language. You just have the words, which are 7% of the meaning. Texts text, text are not conversations. Yeah. And I think people hide behind texts. They want to use their name and... Uh, the whole twittering and all that is 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 to me very um, cowardly in a lot of ways. And I do I, think our our culture has got uh, gotten so that we use those things and we think they're conversations. But I do remember having a conversation with three single moms, and my daughter was the youngest, and she was probably in third or fourth grade at the time about how people have lost the ability to have conversations as as we were watching one of the the middle schoolers fiddling with their phone. And it's like, put it away already. Right. She, was, she was clearly not part of the conversation amongst the group. We are so trained to get our point across, no matter what. And if we don't, if we as a receiver don't let that other person get that point across, they're gonna be fixated on getting their point across and not listening to what you have to say.
Uh, David's gone, so we can't ask him if he had any insights into dealing with folks who are liars. Uh, but I think we, we talked about this a bit, especially about um, the motivation for being part of a productive conversation. If you're not motivated, you're not going to have one. So we have to figure out how do we how do we motivate someone to have a productive conversation? Uh, Deborah, when someone is believing a, a lie and reason doesn't work in the conversation, any insights as to how to deal with those people in those situations? Gently. Gently. <laughs> Very gently. Um, Very I think you know, learning to back off or to um, you know, let it go, let some of the things go and ask for, I think the asking questions is a great way to go and asking for clarification and um, trying to get some common ground that you've talked about somewhere in the conversation because it's so easy to just sort of um, emotions rise so high that you're sort of walking away with a with nothing accomplished and, and gaining patience is a, is a tough one, but I think you can steer that with, with these questions and with, you know, an appropriate response when people make a, a statement that, you know, that is a lie, you know, you have to come around and approach it with some other perspective. Right, go ahead. It's hard. Right. Um, iPhone, LGBTQ plus rights. What's the, that was what me. You, sorry. Uh, been I this? haven't figured out how to name myself on my phone, but, um, I think what she just said about common ground, finding where you can agree and working from that point, I think goes a long way for the other person to feel like they're heard. And then also the thinking styles really stuck out to me because I'm picturing, you know, conversations with my parents and just kind of knowing, you know, okay, my dad's very logical and very practical, like knowing the kinds of language to use and just how to approach. Um, cause it's not just the words, as you said, it's how you say the words, um, and things like that. So knowing what keywords um, appeal to that kind of um, thinking, I think is helpful. Good, good. And what kind of words might set him off? Right, right. Good, um, let's see, Ingrid, conversations when someone is not forthright or is dodging? Uh, I, now. I liked your, um... I think I'm unmuted there. Yeah, um, I liked your suggestions of responses to to um, elucidate things. Um, anyway, sometimes it's just straight out lying. <laughs> yes. And and so maybe just say, do you really believe that is the way to do it? And sometimes I, I felt like it was somebody was try, just plain trying to gaslight me, and say just call it. Call it what it is. Call a spade a spade. Is that gaslighting? And that might might get around some of it. If they understand what gaslighting is. In the first exactly. Place. I had to ask my daughter and she had to explain it to me. All right. Last but not least, Floor. How to ask for a raise. Do you have some insights on how to do that now? No, actually, uh, that was your the question for you to help me <laughs> how to ask for a raise. <laughs> so uh, based on what we've talked about, others, I'm, I'm looking for the wisdom in the room here before I speak. What, what of the techniques that we've talked about do you think might help Floor? Well, be more confident of, you know, of your own, uh, what is it called? of your own skills and creativity. Mm -hmm. I guess that would be the, the main point, you know, when I go to my boss and, and ask, you know, for a raise, I think that would be 
one point. Okay, good. The steps. Be confident. Uh, so I, would, other folks. I would always come from, you have to have reasons. You know, what have you done in your job that, you know, that you should be more valued? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the very practical side. All right, others, other thoughts? Potentially um, considering um, your, the style of your supervisor. So you might know what words or pieces of information are going to resonate with that person. Right. Yes. That's actually where I was going to go. Understanding who your supervisor is, how your supervisor thinks. Is your supervisor expecting that he has this feeling that you're worthy of having the, the raise or is he data driven and wants you needs to hear, I did this, 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 which is what you asked for. Um, what, what, what convinces your boss to make any, any decision? Mm -hmm. And then form your argument in the same way that helps him or her make the decision the way you want them to make it. From my uh, union rabble rousing years, uh, I would work with people when they felt like they were aggrieved. I'd say, write out the grievance. It's a problem solving process. Identify what what the problem is and and for you it would be saying i'm not getting enough pay and write out for yourself what what would solve that problem for you and and i would say to folks write it out because once you write it out it gets it out of your head or it forces you to think about it in a, a way that gives you language that's usable with your boss mm -hmm. This is one of the things I think kids don't understand being on the phone so much. The act of writing out something engages a different part of your brain, the language part of your brain more than when just typing with your fingers. And it really does help you to process your thoughts as well as uh, helps you, your brain to prepare of how to make an argument. So another thing that I would suggest you think about is um, what is your performance relative to your peers? Are there people who are doing the same job that you are who are making more and you're doing it just as good or better? Or in other companies? Are people in the same position in another company and making more than you are? That's mm -hmm. a potential data point. There's supposed to be pay equity. And if you're not making what another person in another company is making, well, that's an interesting situation to think about. Why mm -hmm. am I here when in another company doing the same job, I could be making more? Yeah, Half the fact, right? Have some yep. facts. Have Be facts. logical. <laughs> Be logical. And, and think about, we've talked about ethos, pathos, and logos. When you make your arguments to your, your, your boss, make sure it has those three components to it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it, everyone. All right. Well, we've come to the end of the session. We've talked about communication basics. We've talked about shifting to the learning stance. We've talked about barriers. We've talked about some phrases you can have in your quiver. That's it. Thank you very much, James. This Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been very yeah, helpful. Thanks. Thanks everyone for attending. I hope to see you at some of the other Oyster River Community Read upcoming events.
Thank, Thank you again. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye.